Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to rock and roll photographer Ken Regan, who just released a spectacular collection of his work in the coffee table book, All Access, The Rock and Roll Photography of Ken Regan. Stick around. Stones and Beatles and Bruce? Oh my. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You know, MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Step by and check it out. There are more than 900 archives, celebrity, and pop culture interviews for your listening pleasure. The show is brought to you today by Audible. Audible is offering Mr. Media listeners a free audiobook download and a 14-day trial offer to give you a chance to check out their very cool service. I love listening to books on tape. If you've never tried it before, actors or sometimes the authors themselves read to you. It's great for the commute, the beach, or even unwinding before bed. You can choose a free audiobook from Audible's enormous library of rock and roll titles, including Does the Noise in My Head Bother You? by Steven Tyler of Aerosmith. Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll, and the End of the World, produced by the National Lampoon. And Sex, Money, Kiss by Gene Simmons of Kiss. Here's an excerpt of Sex, Money, Kiss by Gene Simmons. If man was predisposed to being monogamous, biologically, his sexual activity would have been limited to the cave he lived in without spreading his seed in every other cave he rested in as he hunted the migrating herds. Now don't lose me here. So in the days before civilization, before language and culture, we lived in clans. A few people huddled in a cave. Isn't it true that if man was predisposed to being monogamous, that within a generation or two, humankind would have been cross-eyed and retarded? Isn't inbreeding unhealthy? Aren't purebred Dalmatians dumb as a rock? Aren't mutts smart? If nature has given man billions of sperm every time he gets excited, doesn't that mean he's designed to have sex with as many females as possible before he drops dead? I'm not saying he should or should not, only pointing out, isn't that what nature intended? It's no wonder women have been torturing men since the days we crawled out of our caves. Just kidding. You could also download The Profiler. Written by famed criminal profiler Pat Brown and yours truly, which Pat will read to you personally. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience with tinnitus in both ears and no regrets in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Photographer Ken Regan was there when Bob Dylan met Bob Dylan 2.0, Bruce Springsteen, for the first time. And he was there when the Beatles landed in New York City on that fateful day in February 1964. He also shot pictures at Keith Richards' 1983 wedding to Patty Hanson and captured images of a Rolling Stone that day just about as happy, healthy, and delighted as you'll ever see that man. In all access, the rock and roll photography of Ken Regan you and I get to see everything that this American master saw when he was on the scene of pop music's greatest moments. Those include back-to-back tours with the Rolling Stones and Bob Dylan in 1975, the band's last waltz, George Harrison's concert for Bangladesh, and Live Aid in 1985. He's gone on assignment for the best of the best in American journalism, including Time, the New York Times Magazine, Rolling Stone, People, Newsweek, Life, and Entertainment Weekly. I can tell you from my own limited experience covering rock and roll as a journalist in the 1980s and traveling to concerts and events with photographer and then my my then roommate, Dennis Osborne, that the Shutterbergs see, hear, and experience things that no one else does. These guys and gals get special access because they're entrusted to capture moments on film, not in written or recorded words. The irony is that, you know, as that old song goes, every picture tells a story, don't it? Sometimes the photographer's images are more candid and more revealing, maybe always, than anything us ink-stained wretches can take away. Now, let me put it another way. Whatever great on-the-job stories you have, I'll wager that the photographers 
are better. Ken Regan, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you. Good to have you here. You know, the first thought that uh, came to me after reading All Access is this. People seem to like you. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Must be my Irish heritage. <laughs> well, you know, we all, you know, as you know, people, everybody can look at a photo and get something different from it. But the thing I got from photo after photo is that these people are, they're comfortable, they're relaxed, and uh, people who don't usually smile even seem to be letting up a little, little bit with the corners of their mouth when they're, when they're being shot by you. Yeah, that, that seems to be very true throughout my career. I mean, um, you know, I started out as a sports photographer, and then I went into photojournalism and hard news, <clears throat> and then I went in and out of music a lot, uh, still doing some sports and things and still doing a lot of hard news. You know, and I, I think that the big thing for me in photography was I didn't want to be labeled as a sports photographer, as a news photographer, as a music photographer. I wanted to do a little bit of everything, so I tried to diversify my career throughout, which I'm still doing today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for whatever reasons, people really trusted me. Um, they allowed me to do things that they didn't allow before, um, and I don't know what it was, what caused that, but I honored that trust throughout my career. I never, ever, you know, took a photograph that I knew was not something that the subject would like to see in a magazine, and I never, ever allowed any of my photographs to appear in any of the so-called, you know, rags. Mm. So you were careful about the circulation of what Oh, very much so. Yeah. You know, and, and even to this day, <clears throat> you know, if we'll get a call from a magazine, and I'll have to know what the story is before I submit the photograph. You know, and if it's something that's on the fence, you know, I'll call one of the, the um, whoever the, the subject might be, I'll call the manager and say, Do you know, they're doing such and such a story. Is it okay to release this photograph? Hmm. It, it seems to me over the years that uh, musicians, rock stars, if you will, uh, they have all kinds of people coming and wanting to take pictures of them. And, and you can, you, after a while, when you, you start to see that, that side of things, you can see why some of them build up some real resistance. Oh, sure, sure, um, sure. You know, they have some of the worst photographers. They have people who are fans first and photographers second. And then right. they have professional guys like you. Who, I mean, this is what you do. You go out and you shoot pictures of people. You catch them in those moments, and hopefully, you know, everybody comes away happy. And, and that basically came from my experience as a photojournalist. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that opened every single door for me in music. One man, Bill Graham. Hmm. I mean, without Bill, I never would have been able to do any of those things that you mentioned and more. How did you first meet Graham? <clears throat> well, it was really interesting because it, it started off as a, um, a nightmare experience. I was in my teens, you know, because I was doing a lot of photographs for the school paper, and I... You know, I love music, I love sports, I was going to a lot of events, and I used to sneak a camera into the Fillmore East hmm. and take photographs. He would catch me every single time, and, you know, it got to be a joke after a while, and he would grab me by the neck and throw me out, <laughs> <clears throat> and, you know, say all sorts of expletives, and, you know, don't ever come back here again, you know, I'm going to have somebody shoot you, blah, 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 blah. So... In managing to capture some of these images at the Fillmore, you know, I take them around to some of the magazines and newspapers just to show them what I was doing. And, you know, some of them got published, which was great. So there was a wonderful old Irish photo editor at the Sunday Times magazine. His name is Michael O'Keefe. And, you know, he took a real liking to me. And he tried to help me every which way possible. So he calls me up one Thanksgiving right before Thanksgiving, about two weeks before. And he said, and he always used to call me kid. He said, hey, kid, I've got an assignment for you, but I don't know if you can do it. And I said, well, an assignment, a real assignment? And he said, yes. I said, what is it, Mike? He said, I want you to photograph on Thanksgiving Day the annual Thanksgiving dinner and concert at the Fillmore East. But, you know, you probably have family. You probably have to be with it. I said, Mike. Christmas, New Year's, whatever it is, I would do an assignment. <laughs> and then I thought for a minute, should I tell him that Bill Graham hates me? No, I won't. <laughs> I won't tell him that. <clears throat> so 
Thanksgiving Day shows up. I go to the film where I can't tell you how excited I was. I go to the box office. There's a credential. It's the first credential I think I ever had, probably, um, from the certainly from the Fillmore, and it has my name on it. Has the New York Sunday Times Magazine. So I go in, and I think it was the, I think Timothy Leary opened the show, and then Johnny Winter came on, and I was photographing Johnny Winter, and this familiar hand grabs me by the back of the neck, and he says, "Jesus Christ, kid, you got to bust my balls on Thanksgiving. Get out of here." <laughs> and I said, "No, Mr. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, I have a credential. Look, it's from the New York Times." He said, who gave you that? I said, the front office. Drags me out to the front office. You give this kid this credential? He says, yes, he represents the New York Times. How do you know he didn't call him himself or have a friend call in? He said, I ought to fire you. And I said, listen, Mr. Graham, please. It's not his fault. It's not my fault. Would you please take a minute and call Michael O'Keefe, who's the photo editor of the Sunday Times Magazine, at home. It's Thanksgiving. He's there. Here's his number. Gets on the phone. Five minutes later, he comes back and he says, okay, so for the first time, you're legit. Stay out of my way. Don't make any waves and take some photographs. So I shot the whole show and Jefferson Airplane was there and, oh, it's just, it was fantastic. Mm. And then after the show, downstairs in the basement, Bill had decorated the whole basement for a Thanksgiving dinner, you know, putting up um, signs and turkeys and you know all sorts of things and everybody who was in the show came and i was able to photograph them you know online getting food sitting at the tables etc 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 it couldn't have gone better and you know when i left i thanked bill very much and a couple weeks later uh, michael keith called me and he said listen we're going to run that story two or three pages and he said i just want to congratulate you. you did a really good job uh, you seem to have a real in there. And I'm going, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so they did run it, and they ran a big credit on the page for me. So I, one night after the magazine came out, went home, went to my bathroom, which was my dark room, and I made half a dozen prints, and I sent them with the magazine and a note to Bill Graham thanking him. So, I don't know, a <laughs> month, two months go by, not a word. I go, what a prick. <laughs> well, at least he could have called or sent me a note or said thank you. So I'm doing my homework one night. My mom comes in, and she said, Ken, there's a phone call for you. I said, who is it? She said, well, he said his name is Bill Graham, but I don't think it's the preacher <laughs> because he's got a really rough voice. <laughs> so I said, oh, God, what's wrong now? So I go pick up the phone, and I said, yes, Mr. Graham, what's the matter? He said, listen, kid, I just want to tell you something. Those pictures in the magazine were really, really good. And the pictures you sent me, no one has ever sent me photographs before. He said, and I love them. I have them up in my, my office on the wall. He said, anytime you want to come back here, you call me. You're in forevermore. For as long as I'm running the film more, you can come anytime. And that spilled over to the Rolling Stones tour in 1972, to Bob Dylan, to Live Aid, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Amnesty International, you know, all the things I did in music were because of him. And and yet, it's funny because you, you got you got in there and he would have really rather you not have been there and it wasn't because of any other work you had done. It was, it was just somewhere, there was some maneuvering uh, behind both of you that, that made it possible and it changed your life. Right, well, I mean, you know, yeah. Bill, Bill was the big promoter. I mean, of he course. was... You know, he was P.T. Bonham in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, all these bands trusted him. They liked him. They did what he said. You know, and he introduced me. I mean, I had never met these guys before. And he said, listen, this, this guy is really good. He's a good photographer. You can trust him. You can be open with him. You know, he's not going to reveal anything that shouldn't be revealed, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was, that was my entree. And can you, uh, I mean... Uh... Did he have a rep with other photographers at that time for being as gruff and difficult, or was he just singling you out because you were a kid, basically? Well, I think he had uh, somewhat of a relationship with Jim Marshall back in the 60s and 70s. But, you know, if you know about Jim or if you know Jim, Jim can be very difficult. And he, I think, overstepped his boundaries sometimes. Um, 
and you know, I came along and I was, you know, young and innocent and, you know, willing to do everything and anything and Bill took a liking to me. I mean, I was like his little brother. <laughs> Must be difficult to when he passed. To- oh my god. I tell you, that, that probably was the stepping stone for me to almost stop doing music. Really? Yeah, when he, when he died. I was so, you know, I was shattered, totally shattered by that. I'm, I'm really shocked to hear that because... Yeah. Um, and it was, just, it was just a question of, you know, here was a man who, out of the blue made my career in music and suddenly he was gone. And, you know, I mean, I went to the funeral service. I, I see his two sons all the time. I mean, they both, one lives in New York. David lives in, in Pennsylvania. Alex lives here in New York. You know, we have lunch at dinner every once in a while. And, you know, they, they dedicated the street that the film I used to be on uh, about, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, maybe 10, whatever. Uh, and they called it Bill Graham's Way. <laughs> and they had, I guess, five or six replicas of the sign, and they gave one to me, which is in my office. That's very nice. And w- was there another sign under it somewhere that said Bill, Bill Graham's Way, and then below it it said, or the highway yeah, six, with an arrow? Six, well, it said, Bill, you know, it said <laughs> Bill Graham's Way, and then it said, you know, 6th Street or 7th Street, whatever. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> it would have yeah. been good if it said, or the highway. I know, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what was it? Uh, I, I, there's other things I want to ask you about, but I got to I got to ask you: What was it, or who was it, that convinced you to keep shooting music uh, after he passed? If you were that, uh... well, you, you know, Bob. Sometimes you reach a point in your career, no matter what it is, and, and in my <clears throat> particular career as a photographer, as I said, it's always been very diversified. You know, when I started out doing sports, um, after about four or five years, and I was an athlete in school. I just said, you know, I've really had enough of this. I want to do something else. And I think at that point when Bill passed away, I had done so much music. And I didn't know that there was anything left for me to do Mm. that I really wanted to do, you know. And, you know, I mean, I still do a couple of things with Bob. and I I do a couple of things with James Taylor. But, you know, those are just because they're friends and they ask me and I do them. I, I don't go out and solicit stories anymore like I used to to Time and Newsweek and People and all that. So. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, just out of curiosity, can you look at a collection of your photos, like, like here, uh, uh, the book All Access, and define what makes them a whole uh, rather than just unconnected pieces from over the years? Well, you know, I mean, doing this book and going through everything, which took us forever, and my God, if it wasn't for the picture editor who I had the publisher hire, her name is M.C. Marden, and she and I worked together at People Magazine for 20 years. I don't know what we would have done because <coughs> I'm my worst own editor. <laughs> and just going through all this stuff, it was incredible. She would come into my office. She'd go, look, Ken, my God, look what I found. I don't remember this image when we shot it for People. You know, and she had so much enthusiasm. And it just hyped everybody here in the office because it, it was a laborious pro- uh, process. It really was. And, you know, the the, the fact that I have three and a half million images in my library. (laughs) You know, and it covers everything. I mean, it covers wars, it covers politics, music, sports, you know, fashion, on and on and on, you know. And every time I walk in that back room, I say, how did I do this? (laughs) 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 How did this happen? (laughs) I'm always overwhelmed by it. You know, I just, you know, I just feel like I'm one of the luckiest people in, in photography ever. Well, I, I want to I want to ask you one more question, then we'll take a break and come back and talk about some specific photos sure. in the book. But uh, when you have that many pictures, do you uh, now for print? I know you're very selective about you know publications or maybe mm-hmm. online. Uh, can can individual uh, consumers buy prints of your photos? Only in galleries. Oh, not online. Okay, we don't put it. We don't put anything up online. It's too risky. Right. I mean, I've had too many situations over the years, even before the technology change where, you know, people were stealing my photographs. I mean, catch this story, right? Mm -hmm. I'm in Saudi Arabia, right, covering the Desert Storm War. And we drive into Iraq. um, And we stopped, we we rented a a bulletproof Humvee for like, I don't know, $4,000 a week. Myself and the reporter drive into Iraq. We're driving all around, all around. We need some gas. We pull into a gas station. 
broken down old gas station. So the guy comes out. We asked for some gas. I went in to use the men's room, which I walked in, and I decided not to use it. <laughs> and I came out, and I was walking past the counter. I looked up. I said, oh, my God, that's my poster of Madonna. <laughs> yeah, with Arabic writing on it. And it was an a iconic shot I did of Madonna for People magazine in 1983, 84, when she was first breaking out on the scene. It was her second magazine cover. And here, you know, 15 years later, it's hanging in a garage in Iraq. <laughs> you know, and it was ripped wow. off. I mean, yeah, as, yeah, as, no, I get that, yeah. As, as that, and that happens. I mean, I, I finally gave up. I spent so much money on lawyers trying to have things, you know, de- cease and desist. Um, but it, it's just fruitless. But no, we, we, we sell things in gallery. I only started doing gallery shows about four years ago, I guess, um, at the Pop Gallery. And I just switched galleries <clears throat> this past year um, with the Morrison Hotel Gallery in New York. Mm-hmm. And now, because of the book, um, there's a lot of interest. There's, a, there's two galleries in California that want to do shows, one in Canada, uh, one in uh, Ireland. Well, I, actually, I did a show in Ireland last year, a Bob Dylan show. Um, but, you know, we're suddenly getting a lot of interest from a lot of different galleries. Mm. Yeah, I can, I can imagine people. I mean, I look at pictures in this and go, "Wow, I'd love to get a print of this or that." It's just, uh, it's amazing what's there. Um, all right, well, let's do this. Let's take a quick break, and we'll come back and uh, talk about some specific photos in the book. Um, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media interview with rock and roll photographer Ken Regan, uh, some of whose greatest work is collected in the new book All Access: The Rock and Roll Photography of Ken Regan. And we'll be right back. How can we help our kids prepare for the future? This is Stevie Van Zandt. I don't have to tell you that children face pretty tough challenges these days. It can be pretty hard to keep them involved in their schoolwork. We adults need to make sure our kids find something in school that really sparks their interest. And nothing does that like music. Not only is music in school fun, but studies show that kids who learn music find science and math concepts easier to grasp and that they show significant increases in self-esteem and thinking skills. Music and creativity go together. Your school music teacher can tell you all about it. So help prepare your children for the future. Art is not a luxury. It is an essential component of the quality of life. Encourage them to learn to love music. A PSA brought to you by MENC, the National Association for Music Education. Music, part of a sound education. Hi, this is Ron Dante of the Archies. You're listening to Mr. Media, and he'll get no sugar sugar from me today unless he plays my record. This is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media interview with rock and roll photographer Ken Regan, some of whose greatest work is collected in the new book All Access, the rock and roll photography of Ken Regan. Uh, Ken, before the show, we picked out a number of uh, specific photos from All Access to talk about individually, but there's one that was not in that group that I have to ask you about because uh, when I, I went through the book uh, last night with my, my wife and my, my teenage daughter, uh, it, was a, it was a real showstopper. It's uh, on the... What, what is, I, I'm very curious. What did your daughter think of them? Uh, she was fascinated. She didn't recognize Madonna in the Live Aid photo, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, she, it was too, she was too young. She's used to... I mean, Madonna and I are the same age. She's used to seeing Madonna at her dad's age, not right, you right, know, right. 20 yeah. years old. Yeah. And then there was I, this... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I have that same problem here. I have two young assistants uh, who just graduated from uh, photography school, and we go through things, and I, I have these quizzes. <laughs> so I say, okay, who's this? They have no idea. <laughs> Who's this? I have no idea. <laughs> but they're learning. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, my daughter uh, has, has and plays electric guitar, and she can play a little Clash. Oh, cool. She can, she cool. can play a little Ramones and uh, the, uh, the Dolly Rots. But, you know, these older f- photos that you and I are so accustomed to, whether they're yours or someone else's, they don't, they don't connect. Uh, she, no. no. She, she's seen uh, Bruce Springsteen live, but she knows the Springsteen who's in his mid-50s. Sure, sure. She sees a picture of him with Bob Dylan. Well, Bob Dylan hasn't changed as much 
as Bruce Springsteen has in that period of time. Right. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. But this one photo that stopped all of us dead was right on the title page. It's this picture of Simon Le Bon from uh, oh. Duran Duran standing. I, you got to explain. He's standing on the edge of the steel structure overlooking a city. It's 1985. What is, what, what is, what's going on there? And where were you taking the picture? Well, I mean, I, I must compliment Simon for doing that because... <laughs> As you can see from the photograph, it was a little hairy. Yeah. Uh, they were doing a music video for a James Bond movie. Mm. And, you know, we were, we were all up and down the Eiffel Tower, and I saw this spot, you know, and I, I asked the guys if one of them would like to, you know, sort of lean out a little bit so we could, you know, emphasize the Bond thriller and all that. And Simon said, I'll do it. And, you know, I had an extremely wide-angle lens so you could see him and the tower and the city and everything. And, and I'm sorry, where was that? On the Eiffel Tower. It was Paris. the Eiffel Tower. Okay, oh, yeah, that, yeah. That's yeah, what yeah. I guess because of the steel. Yeah. The steel yeah. kind of gives it away, but, I, yeah, it's an amazing picture. And Oh, thanks. Ironically, you know, I, in the introduction to the show, I talk about uh, my, uh, my photographer friend, uh, Dennis Osborne, from back in the 80s. My favorite story of covering something with him, because we were, we were a team wherever we went, was... Uh, when uh, Duran Duran, I believe they started their U.S. tour in Lakeland, Florida, where a lot of bands did. Rolling Stones uh-huh. would start their tours there. Sometimes Prince did. And uh, so I covered their first show, and 10,000 screaming uh, gir- little girls and their mothers were screaming. And it was the, it, one of the most insane nights. Well, when it was over, Dennis, who could go anywhere because of his camera, well, I couldn't, he went backstage. Now, the band had left. And they had left, but what they had left behind was like a mountain of stuffed animals and oh, yeah, personal yeah, yeah. messages. And so he grabbed a couple of the stuffed animals and then he grabbed, and, and then he said, what do you think? Should I go back and get some of the letters? They just left them. I said, yeah, it'd be interesting. Oh, for sure. I'd yeah. love to know what these girls are writing to them. So he brought them back and we're reading them. We're sitting in the car. It's like, you know, one o'clock in the morning and we're reading them. <laughs> and your, your eyes, I mean, I was only, I don't know, 23, 24 myself. Yeah. And my eyes would were popping out of the sockets reading what these little 12 and 13 year old girls and how they you know they wanted to f this and f that oh yeah oh my god john taylor yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so here's here's the end of the story and then i want to get back to your stories but i worked at something called music magazine it was a you know weekly free Mm -hmm. review type of thing and uh i took the dennis didn't want the letters he didn't care about stuff like that i took them back to the magazine and the next day the editor and i were reading through them and he said i got a great idea he said i do a great british accent I said, okay. He said, look, so many of these girls put their phone numbers in the letters. You know, this is before email. So I said, let's call a few of them. I said, oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. So he did. And, you know, he said, "Uh, hello, can I speak to Elizabeth? (laughs) Um, Yes, uh, I'll get her for you. Uh, Can I ask who's calling? Uh, Just tell her it's uh, John Taylor, love. (laughs) And and he would say, uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, hi, this is John Taylor, and they're screaming and screaming. Um, so I got your letter from the concert, and I'm just really, did you really mean that you wanted to f my brains out? <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> oh my God, it was just, yeah. it killed me. Anyway, I still have the letters. I can prove well, the story was true. Yeah, well, John and uh, one of the other guys were involved in a <clears throat> recording studio here in my building so I know John really well they were on the third or fourth floor uh, for years and years and years so well if they want if they want their letters let me know okay (laughs) (laughs) I got them they're right here Um, All right. well let's go from from one British uh, iconic band to another let's go back to 1964 you're at John F. Kennedy airport before we were calling it JFK I suspect and you've got this picture of the Beatles out front of the plane, and they're looking up at the sky. Are they right. looking up at the fans screaming, or is it something else? Bob, you've never seen anything like it. There must have been, you know, the airport, which could never happen today, let all of these fans on the balcony. <laughs> and it just went on for, like, miles. And when the Beatles came off the plane, all these kids, you know, on the railing were screaming and yelling, you know, and I'm sure the Beatles never witnessed anything like this before because I don't think anybody did. Mm. So that's what they were looking at. That's incredible. And and you've got other shots from that. You've got the um, the great shot. The, the, the one shot I really love, you, you followed them to, um, I don't know, necessarily mean that you followed them, but you were there during the rehearsals and, and uh, 
a production of the Ed, the famous Ed Sullivan spot. Right, and and again, that was one of those situations where it was very very closed and limited. But one of my classmates' father was an executive at CBS, mm-hmm. and he got me into the rehearsal. Uh, and you, and you, there's two pictures that really stand out for me, and we don't have these to show. But one is uh, you have a, a a slightly different angle on the band as they're playing. You you show how short the ceiling is. You actually we actually see the depth of the stage they're on, which is not right, that deep. Right. But you see the ceiling, and I thought that's an angle on that sh- that shot that this iconic image of them playing on the Sullivan Show. I've never seen it from that perspective. It's very cool. Well, that's that's one of the things I always tried to do. I tried to to do something that was a little bit different. Like, I do a lot of work on motion pictures right now, hmm. and a lot of photographers who work on motion pictures are obsessed with standing right next to the camera to get the same shot that they're filming. Why? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I, however, try and move around and get something a little bit different, you know, et cetera. Et cetera. Because, you know, for for me, it's again my photojournalism training. And I know what magazines and newspapers are looking for. And, you know, in some cases, these guys don't. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the contemporary of the Beatles, of course, at the time were, were the Rolling Stones. But you have a later picture uh, of Mick Jagger that I really like. It's Jagger sitting on a bench. He's got his arms uh, he's tr- sideways on the bench. He's got his arms uh, wrapped around his knees. And I, I hope this won't sound bad, but I thought looking at it, he, it could pass for a, a college student being photographed by his girlfriend in that shot based on his expression and the ease right. he has with the photographer. Yeah, that was in Central Park. Hmm. And we were doing a cover story for a British magazine. And we started at his house. He used to have a townhouse over in the 80s on the west side. And we did a whole series of photographs there. We did a series, you know, he's a, a workout. I mean, he works out every single day without fail. So we did a whole series of photographs of him working out and then running in Riverside Park. And then, you know, he said, hey, listen, I'm going to go down to um, Andy Warhol's. You want to come along? I said, why not? Sure. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) And so he said, let's just kind of walk through the city. You know, we'll just see what comes along. We'll go through Central Park. We'll see if there's anything that looks good for you to photograph. So we just, you know... We took a little walk, and we went through Central Park, and um, the park bench shot for me just said something. It said New York. A lot of people sit on, on, on the park benches in New York. And to have Mick Jagger sitting on a park bench in New York, in Central Park, you don't see that very often. No, no. No, you wouldn't. You, and, and these days, probably even less so than at the time. Oh, yeah, took the yeah, shot. sure. Well, so you have this great shot of, uh, of Mick in the park. I love the wedding photos uh, of, oh, of Keith, Keith and Patty. Uh, um, because, and I see it – we talked about this before the show started. Uh, I see Keith Richards so differently today than I did before reading his book. And knowing from the book that your pictures car- capture him incredibly happy on that day. But having read the book now, I realize he really was happy. I mean, that oh, was, he, was. he oh, put so much history behind him that day. Yeah. I mean, she saved his life. I mean, I don't think Keith would be alive today if he hadn't met and married Patty Hanson. One of the most extraordinary women I've ever met, you know, and kind and loving and caring, you know, and she just, she turned his life around. It's great. I mean, it's just great shots, and it it just... Oh, thanks. And and again, it was one of those situations where there were no other photographers. It was just me. Mm. Ah. Ken Regan, wedding photographer. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's funny you say that because, you know, throughout my career, when I, whenever I'd had conversations with people, and, and Keith had been one of them, you know, and I, I would say, when we talk about photography for a few minutes for whatever reason, um, and they say, well, what, what, what have you done in your career, blah, 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 uh, what don't you want to do, what, what do you still want to do? And I said, well, three things that I really don't want to do. Weddings, baptisms, and bar mitzvahs. <laughs> so Keith got me to do two of them. <laughs> the wedding, and I did both the birth of his, of his two daughters. I, I noticed circumcisions were not on that list. What's the no, deal? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yes, from the man who photographed Live Aid. 
a circumcision. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got to ask you about photographing Bob Dylan. I mean, this is a guy who um, a, a lot of people who I guess don't know him, I'll, I'll put it that way, paint him as reclusive, as distant and unpleasant. But I see him very differently in your pictures. And I, I wondered, um, you know, how did you, you've photographed him a lot. How did you reach a point of trust with Bob Dylan? Well, you know, I grew up idolizing Bob Dylan. And one of the first music photographs I took um, was Bob Dylan at Forest Hills. And it was the first, not the first music photograph, but the first picture of him. And it was his second appearance when he went electric. And as they booed him off the stage in Newport, they practically booed him off the stage in Forest Hills. Anyway, I shot some black and white, and I just, it's one of my favorite photographs. So, subsequent to that, Bob had a, um, Bob was supposed to be at Woodstock, but he had a motorcycle accident. I think it was in 67 or 68. Mm -hmm. And he went into a shell, and nobody saw him for years and years and years. I'm talking about two or three years. So, there was a tribute to Woody Guthrie at Carnegie Hall. And, you know, Joan Baez, Aretha Franklin, Pete Seeger, Arlo Guthrie, you know, all, all the big folk people. And I asked Newsweek if I could, you know, get them to get me a credential to shoot it. And they did. And they said, listen, um, this is the deal. You're allowed to go in and shoot the opening song, and then you have to leave. I said, what? I said, why bother? Right. They said, well, that's the restrictions they're putting on it. So what I did was I didn't go in with the rest of the photographers and shoot the opening song. I happened to get a scalper outside who had a ticket in the balcony, which I bought. And I went upstairs with my long lens and photographed the entire concert. And about two-thirds of the way through the concert, this guy comes out on stage. I'm saying, who the hell is that? And then suddenly I realized it was Bob Dylan. <laughs> I mean, because he looked so different, totally different. So Newsweek obviously was very pleased with that. And then I guess in subsequent years, um, Bob was going out on a tour with the band. And it was his first tour, I think, since the accident. And it was going to be his last tour with the band. So I called Bill up. And Bill said, oh, boy, you know, he's really difficult. I don't know if I can clear this for you. Hmm. And I said, well, Time Magazine is asking me to shoot it, Bill, and they want to do maybe two or three pages of color. He says, yeah, well, that doesn't mean a thing for Bob. <laughs> so about a week went by, and Bill said, okay, uh, this is the deal. You can come out to Chicago, and there's going to be two shows there. You can shoot the shows. I'll actually be able to get you up on stage for some of the numbers. Hmm. But you can't go backstage, you know, don't bother Bob, don't get in anybody's way, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, great. I called time up, and they said, sure, go for it. So I go out there, and, you know, I mean, Bob Dylan and the band, it was very exciting. You know, I, I shoot the first day, and um, Bob actually came over to me and said, um, oh, but you're, you're the guy Bill Graham recommended. You're shooting for time. I said, yes. He said, well, nice to meet you. That was it. And during the first show, in the audience was this woman, and she was probably in her 60s, surrounded by screaming kids, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old. Yeah, and some long-haired hippies who might have been a little bit older. So I always like to photograph, you know, audiences, especially if there's something interesting. So, and this was an interesting photograph because here's this woman amongst all these kids. So I, I took some pictures of her. I come back the next night, and she's there again. I'm going, this is bizarre. So I photographed her again. So at the end of the show, um, I went back to thank Bill Graham for everything. And he said, you know, Bob's doing another show in New York. If you want to shoot it, uh, check with Time Magazine. I'll see if it's, if it's okay, because, you know, he seemed to have no objection to you. I said, fine, I'll let you know. I said, Bill, tell me something. In the first two or three rows, right by the stage, there was a woman in her 60s, clapping and jumping up and down. and blah, blah, blah. He said, why are you asking about her? 
I said, I was just curious. I took some photographs of her. He said, you took photographs of her? I said, yeah, why? Did I do something wrong? He said, Ken, that's Bob's mother. Don't <laughs> ever, ever, ever release those photographs. Oh, my. So, I don't know how much time passed, but I sent some photographs to Bob. I'm, I'm very good about doing it. I like doing that, you know, just as a, a payback. It's the least I could do. And I sent some pictures of, of his mom with the pictures of him in the band on stage. And I said, Bob, <clears throat> you know, I explained very briefly that I didn't know it was his mom. Bill Graham told me, you know, don't worry, the pictures will never be released. But I thought, you know, I might like to have some. So fine, never heard from him. <laughs> and I guess it was maybe, I don't know, nine months later or whatever. I get a call at three or four in the morning from Bill Graham's partner, Barry Imhoff. I'm sound asleep. And um, <clears throat> Barry says, what are you doing? I said, Barry, you guys in L.A. always call people you know, on your time, and it's like the wee hours of the morning, and you ask me what I'm, what I'm doing. I'm sleeping. <laughs> so he says, well, listen, what are you doing in the next couple of months? And I said, Barry, I have no idea. I said, you know, I'm doing a lot of photojournalism, traveling all over the world. I, I don't know why. He said, well, there's a, a tour coming up, and we'd like to talk to you about it. And I said, whose tour? He said, let me put somebody on the phone. So this guy gets on the phone, and he says, hi, my name is Louis Kemp. I own Kemp Fisheries. I go, I'm going to kill Barry. This is some kind of a joke. <laughs> so Louis then explains to me, he grew up with Bob Dylan in, in Minnesota, boyhood friends, and Bob has asked him to help out on this tour that he's doing that Bill Graham is going to promote. I said, fine. He said, well, you know, We've heard some good things about you. We've seen some of your work. Um, can you do the tour? And I said, you know, Louis, I just don't know. I, I can't answer this at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, and I, I said, Louis, I, I just want to say something. If, if this is a joke, tell Barry I'm going to hunt him down. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> and he said, just a second. And Bob gets on the phone. <laughs> and Bob says, listen, I'm sorry we disturbed you. Um, I really like your work a lot, and that was so nice of you to send me those pictures of my mom. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you not releasing them. Uh, you know, could you meet us at SIR tomorrow uh, to talk about this tour? And I said, sure. And he said, you know, bring, bring your portfolio over if you have one. So I went over and he spent, I don't know, a half hour, 45 minutes, showed him all my work. And he said to me, listen, he said, I'm going to do something that I've never, ever done before. I've never allowed this to happen before, but I want you to photograph this tour 24-7. Wow. Every minute of the day, I'm yours. I'm accessible. Everybody on, on the tour is going to be accessible. There's no restrictions. You can do whatever you want. And, you know, three months later, I shot 13,750 photographs. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and Bob's never done that before. And I, I don't think he's done it since. Yeah, well, it's a big, you know. <laughs> and he just opened up. I mean, he was a whole different person. And what, I mean, delightful to, to work with. And, you know, I mean, he, he'd sit down at these meetings we'd have, and he says, okay, we're going to Massachusetts in two days. Anybody have any ideas up there where we can shoot? Because they were doing a movie, which he was directing, mm -hmm. for Ronaldo and Clara. Jeez. You know, people would pitch out ideas and blah, 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 blah. And he said, Ken, you're home in Massachusetts. What about you? So I suggested this place, which is legendary. It's called the Dreamaway Lodge. And it's run by this old gypsy woman, and it's, it's an extraordinary place. We wound up shooting there for a whole day. Not only did we wind up shooting there, but Mama, who owned the place and plays guitar, Bob took her to Boston, and she became the opening act in Boston. <laughs> Oh, my God. You know, here's this gypsy woman, you know, dressed like right out of central casting on the stage in front of all these kids in, in, in Boston playing two songs. <laughs> oh, man. And then, you know, that cemented the relationship, you know, and I've been working with Bob ever since. That's, uh, it's quite a story. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Now I, I'm looking at the time, and I I, I I feel like I could I could keep talking to you for hours about this, but I I uh, I, I won't do that. I, I do want to ask you about just a couple more pictures, and we'll, sure. we'll, we'll let you get on with your day. Um, I love the shot, and this is 
it, it's this is so different from pretty much anything else in the book. You have this picture of the guys from Run DMC in the con- uh, in the convertible in front of in blocking the street in front of the Hollis uh, Grocery, I guess in Queens. Yeah, that's that's in the hood. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that, and, and why you for that shot? Well, People Magazine hired me to do a story mm. on Run DMC, and, um, you know, I met them out there. We were, you know, we were all over the neighborhood, you know, and I, I, they had this car, and it just, you know, when you're in, a, in on a shoot and you're with people and you, you see the surroundings, you know, you try and come up with something that <clears throat> is imaginative, creative, different, and I just envisioned them with this, you know, convertible in the hood with the store, you know, everything like that. And they had their security guard with us who blocked off traffic. So we kind of shut down the street for 10 minutes, maybe. And it turned out to be really good. Everybody loved it. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the shot I, I see is black and white. Uh, yeah, it's would, black and white. It would not have been the same picture in color. I just no, definitely think. not. No. Yeah. And I always shot everything both in black and white and color, for the most part, whenever, whenever, whenever the opportunity lent itself, because, you know, I had an agency, we used to syndicate things all over the world, and, you know, especially in Europe, they, they were more prone to use color than black and white. Mm. But it, you're absolutely right, it works so much better in black and white. Oh, it's just, uh, it's an amazing photo. Um, oh, thanks. And I, I gotta add, this is a little off topic for the photos in particular, but I'm curious, how has digital photography affected what you do, what you do over the years? I don't even want to go there. <laughs> okay. I I just about maybe a year and a half ago had to convert to digital and I hate it. Mm. <clears throat> I just don't like it at all, and it worries me because people lose things. Mm. And you know I, I'm printing things from negatives from twenty thirty years ago, and you know we've had a couple of instances where I did a, a shoot for Rolling Stone two or three summers ago with James Taylor up in Massachusetts, um, where we both happen to live. And we're, uh, James is very athletic, and, and he's into rowing, you know, and he's got a, a two-man skull. So uh, if, I don't know if you know what that is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we went out in the lake, and it was like, I don't know, 5 o'clock, 5.30. The sun was starting to set. The, the sun was glistening off of the water, you know, and I shot this picture of him. I closed down the aperture so it's a silhouette. And it was just, you know, it's one of those pictures you look at, and it looked great. And I saw it instantly because I had a digital camera. Came back to land, we're finished with with the shoot for the day, gave it to my assistant, who put it in the um, computer. We got back to New York, it was gone. Couldn't find it. And fortunately, we found a a place in California um, that you can buy a program from to find things that are missing. Mm -hmm. And we found it. Oh. Well, but, you know, on another occasion, I was doing all the photography for Jonathan Demi, who's a good friend of mine, on Manchurian Candidate. And we were doing these um, pre-production shots. And we rented a big studio. We had Meryl Streep, Denzel Washington, John Voight, Liev Shriver, you know, on and on and on. And we, it was my very first, I think, major shoot with a digital camera. And I, I had the technicians come over. I had my assistants who were familiar with digital camera. And we did all these tests the day before. And the next day we come in to look at the test on the computer, gone. Mm. And I, I called the technician in a panic. He came over. He couldn't figure out what was going on. And I said, because they wanted digital because they were in a big rush. And that particular day, the set designer was there. I said, listen, I'll shoot some digital, but we've got to shoot film. I said, this is what happened yesterday. This happens today. You're screwed. Mm-hmm. So we shot Polaroids like I used to shoot. We shot film. We shot digital, and it all worked out. Wow! Now, are you con- are you converting your three million uh, photos to digital for? Well, uh, Tom and Taylor, who worked for me, and Kelly before her, um, what they've been doing over the last couple of years is they've been downloading important images into the computer, hmm. and then onto a hard drive, and then maybe storing them in multiple locations. So, well, <clears throat> you know the famous story about Jacques Lowe? No. Uh-uh. You know who he was? No, I'm afraid I don't. <clears throat> Jacques Lowe was a very, very excellent French photographer. And back in the 60s, he was doing a shoot for Parry Match with a very young Jackie Kennedy, who was engaged at the time to JFK. 
And she took a liking to him. So when she ultimately married John and went to the White House, every time there was a special shoot, she hired Jacques Lowe to shoot it. I mean, he had amazing access, you know, just incredible photographs. So maybe in the end of the 90s, Jacques died. And his family wanted to secure all of his contact sheets, black and white negatives, color images, everything like that. And they figured, you know, let's try and find the most safe place in the world to put it. And they, they bought this huge safe, right? And they put all those in there, and they rented a space in the World Trade Center. Oh. Gone. Everything. Lost. Oh, completely. Yeah. God. So there is no safe place. No. <clears throat> After I heard that story, no safe place. No. But you can, the, I mean, the difference between then and now is you can digitize everything and then send it to multiple, uh, you know. Oh, you can, yeah, yeah. Locations yeah. that way. That it gives it. you a better right. shot at, you know, right. fire or whatever. All right, all right. So one more question about these photos. And I, I, you've been so gracious with your time. I can't believe how much uh, time has, has gone by us here. Um, another rare moment, and, and Dylan is in this shot, is you captured this first meeting between Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan. And I wondered mm -hmm. if you can set the scene a little. And also, did you know it was about to happen? And was it as big a deal then as it's perceived now? Well, um, let's see. I think it was a really big deal because, you know, Bob was the guy and Bruce was coming up. And Bruce was getting a lot of play. I think that summer or sometime that year, Bruce appeared on the cover of both Time and Newsweek the same week. 73, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so it was a year before the tour. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he was getting big. And, you know, we had people coming in and out of that tour, you know. I mean, everybody wanted to come on the tour. We had no idea that Bruce was going to stop by in this venue in Connecticut to say hello. And as, as often was the case, you know, I was in the dressing room with Bob and some people or just Bob and myself. And, you know, there was a knock on the door and somebody came in and whispered in Bob's ear and, and Bob said, yeah, sure. And Bruce walked in. And it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and, again, it, it's one of those situations where you don't want to abuse your privilege. Mm -hmm. So I stayed there maybe a couple of minutes, took what I thought were the good images, and then I left them alone. Mm. It, it's amazing, this picture, because Dylan looks younger than Springsteen. Dylan does not I have know. a beard no. in that picture. <laughs> yeah, and and he, he, lo he looks like the kid, and Springsteen looks like the withered old veteran. Yeah, the old guy. Yeah, I know. He's funny. <laughs> It's just, it's a great, great photo. Uh, yeah, and, and Bruce is great. I worked with him, you know, through the years a couple of times. I had on a uh, show, on the show about a year or two ago, a guy named Tom Weschler, who was uh, Bob Seeger's road manager and uh, uh, photographed everything that Seeger did for like 20, 30 years. It's funny, I was just looking at Bob Seeger photographs yesterday that I did. Oh, well. Or something, yeah. Well, he has a picture of... Um, uh, w the first time that Seeger and Springsteen met, and uh, mm -hmm. it's a similar kind of moment, you know, and backstage kind of thing. And uh, you know, it's just very cool to see another one of these. I mean, th th these are, I mean, Springsteen and Seeger and Mellencamp, guys like that. That's that's my, you know, those are yeah. my oh, yeah. things. Yeah. And it's to Me see too. these pictures of them meeting these, you know, Dylan or whatever. It's just very cool to be able to have that that well backstage access, basically. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was great. It was just you know. I mean, I, again, I had that access with the Kennedy family, which was amazing. Mm. You know, I was Ted's kind of unofficial photographer for 25 years. And, you know, just, again, went all over the world with him, went, you know, to family affairs up in Hyannisport, you know, and had incredible, I, mean, I must have almost 200,000 pictures of Ted and his family. Oh, my God. Well, and you have yeah. a picture in the book of uh, Ted uh, with yeah. Linda Ronstadt, right? You're right, right, yeah. at Tanglewood, sure. Yep. Yeah. Great, great shot, great shot. So. All right, so last question. We'll let you go. Uh, okay. Completely unrelated to rock and roll. You mentioned uh, that you're doing a lot of movie work, and then I, I also was told that you're uh, doing some work on uh, the Showtime series, The Big C. Can you tell yes. us a little about, about what you're currently doing? Well, I, I, the last year or so, I worked on three amazing projects. The first one being um, in Budapest with Angelina Jolie. She's written produced and directed her first film that she's not starring in. Mm -hmm. And it's a love story about uh, this couple from Bosnia. 
And she was extraordinary. I mean, so kind, so generous, so... I mean, she must have been studying this for two or three years because she did not make a mistake. Everything she did was perfect. And what was really interesting, she decided to do the film both in English and in Serb Croatian. Wow. So she'd do three takes in English and then three takes in Serb Croatian. And all the actors were Serbs and Croatians. And so I went back and forth to Budapest like two or three times because I couldn't be there for the whole film. She wanted me to be there for the whole film, but I had other commitments. And it was great. It was just really terrific. The movie is opening in December. I think it's already been picked up by a couple of festivals. Yeah, I just saw a story in uh, this week's uh, Entertainment Weekly about it. They yeah, that's my feature. photograph. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah the small, big one. Small world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and so while I was doing that, I was doing um, Nurse Jackie and, I don't know, four or five different pilots. Now, Nurse Jackie is the Edie Falco series, right, right, which, which I've done for three years and hope to do it again this year. Um, I finished that, and then in uh, the early part of the winter, in January and February, we were doing some other, you know, some magazine things and a couple of pilots and things. And then I, I went on to Big C, which I'd done the year before. Hmm. And Laura Linney and I have been friends for 10 or 12 years. She has a home up near me, and we're really good pals, and, and she's wonderful to work with, and it's a really interesting show because of, of the, the nature of the subject. Mm -hmm. You know, she's got stage four melanoma. Uh, and it, it's so well written and well directed and a really good cast. And we just finished the second season uh, beginning of, uh, I'm sorry, the end of June, which will start airing, you know, next year. And, and that show did something that uh, a lot of people thought would never happen. It, I mean, it's been great for Laura Linney, but the uh, girl who's, name completely escapes me who was in precious it actually showed this completely oh, Gabby, different side. Gabby, yeah, oh yeah. my god she's so great she's I so mean, much fun it's so <laughs> you know uh, most people would have thought okay she had her, her shot she had a movie that fit her very well yeah. and then she she was thrown into this and it's like you know the girl can actually act she's very personal oh, she can and she dances yeah. she sings she does everything she's wonderful it's crazy so yeah, yeah good good for them well listen uh, uh Folks, you can find uh, Ken Regan's uh, spectacular, and I know he doesn't like to use these, me to use these kind of words, but it is a spectacular uh, photography collection. It's called. Well, thanks. Uh, I appreciate that. My pleasure. Uh, I think people could tell from the way I talked about it during the past uh, well hour uh, how much I enjoyed it. Um, it's called All Access: The Rock and Roll Photography of Ken Regan. It's in. Uh, one other thing, Bob. Let me yeah, interrupt. Sure. All Access: Rock and Roll Photography of Ken Regan, published by Insight Editions Palace Press. We could just put a little plug in there for the publisher. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's Inside Editions dash Palace Press. All right. And I want to tell people you can get that in great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. And Ken, I understand you have a website. It's kenregan.com? Yes, it is, yeah. All right. Yeah. People can find out more information there. I imagine and, and the book is already on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. That. Uh, Easy to find, easy to order, and well worth uh, the time and money. Great collection of stuff. And, Ken, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Media. Oh, thank today. you. I really appreciate the, your, your time and your effort. You've been very easy to talk to. I appreciate hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, and please okay. come back and talk to us again soon. Great. Take care now. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And, folks, for more original interviews with America's top up-and-coming musicians, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. If you've enjoyed today's show, you can subscribe for free to Mr. Media via email, RSS, or iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. You can also download our new free Mr. Media mobile app for the Android on the Android market. And, of course, you can listen with a piece of string and a tin can in most parts of my hometown, Brooklyn. Show your support of Mr. Media by supporting our sponsors, including Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. And if you're in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania metro area, i got another sponsor you can call on. It's the PartyAuthority.us. Call DJ Ira for all your party entertainment needs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs or visit their website, thepartyauthority.us. And I'll give you a little hint. DJ Ira, my brother. If you've got an idea for a guest, a comment on today's show, or would like to advertise on Mr. Media, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com. You can also call our 24-hour listener line, 
Some messages may be used in an upcoming show, and unless you live next door to me, it's probably a tow call involved. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or our new YouTube video channel. Thanks so much for joining us today, folks. I really appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. See you next time, everybody. Hey, folks. You can hear Mr. Media while on the go now with Stitcher Smart Radio. Stitcher is a free news and talk mobile app available for your smartphone, whether you use an iPhone, iPod Touch, Android, BlackBerry Curve, or Palm Pre. And when you download Stitcher to hear Mr. Media today, you have a chance to win some real money. Downloading is quick and easy. Just find Stitcher in your smartphone's app store. Download it. It's free. Take seconds. Then, during registration, hit the promo code box and enter Mr. Media, that's MR Media, to get automatically entered to win $100. The latest episode of Mr. Media will be waiting for you in Stitcher's Favorites right on your phone. You'll get access to lots of other amazing shows, too, always available to you on demand, no syncing. Some of my favorites include WTF with Mark Marin, Plus One Per Diem with Kevin Smith, and The Nerdist with Chris Hardwick. It's all free and all instant to you on Stitcher Smart Radio. And don't forget to win the money. Enter promo code Mr. Media, MR Media, when you register. And thanks for listening.